If the people who know you were asked to describe you in two words, what words would they choose? What two characteristics best describe the true you? Give that some thought, because on today's podcast, we are going to discover the two characteristics that God is looking for in our lives. Welcome to Crosstalk, a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life into all our lives. I'm Brian French. Today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkis, and Nathan Norman continue their discussion through the book of James by looking at James chapter 1, verse 27. If you have a Bible handy, turn to James chapter 1, verse 27, as we join their discussion. I lived in New England a few years ago, and while I was there, I developed a new and somewhat unusual interest. I started visiting graveyards. <laughs> I wasn't feeling sick, but the town I lived in was founded back in 1793, so it had lots of history. And it was interesting to visit those ancient burial plots to see what people put on their tombstones. I, I find it fascinating because that's like a, a summary statement of their life. All that I could find out about these people long dead were the few words written on their tombstone. I found them often very revealing. And it's made me wonder a little bit, what words do you think people would want written on their tombstones to describe their life? People you know, what words would they want on their tombstone? Would they want people to remember them by? If you can only pick two words, what are some of the words you think people would want? Uh, two words? Oh, this is yeah. like a party game. Give us more than two. No, um, two words. It costs money to have those things engraved, Vicky. That's right. It's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I think intelligent. Um, okay. I know some people would want right on there. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people want to be known as successful and good looking. Technically, that would be three words. Thanks, friend. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just saying this is too hard. So I'm, I'm going to pivot here, even though I hate that word now, and um, change the subject so you won't notice that I'm going to use more than two words. I used to live next to a cemetery, and my parents looked over the ocean, and behind them was the cemetery. So I'm, I'm like you, I'm used to walking through cemeteries and looking at tombstones, and the best one I ever read said, it was whittled, old cemetery, obviously, whittled by a man for his wife. And it said, she's gone and we sure miss her. Wow. So the one word maybe he was trying to use was love. Oh yeah, taught me, put it in one word. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yes, it's interesting. That, that's true. I see so many words, you know, beloved mother and father and whatever, and they have these, these kind of stock phrases you see often on many gravestones. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not I'm not saying they should not be written. But when people as they're living their life, the two things that they want to best describe them are often not the things written on their tombstones. What is it that we really want to be known by? When I thought of that, I thought of what James wrote in James chapter one, verse 27. And he says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep themselves polluted from the world. So the first thing is to look after orphans and widows in their distress. To me, that speaks of uh, generosity. And the second, to keep oneself polluted by the world. To me, that's defined as holiness. I think and you these meant are to the say two... unpolluted. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so these are the two things that God really wants to see in his people. If you're going to follow me, these are the two characteristics that have to be there. And I find it interesting just to note the difference between these two. Uh, let's start with the second one. Let's start with holiness. So. God's people are to be known 
for what they do not do. They are not to be morally tainted by the world. So to be a child of God does mean we don't lie, cheat, steal, and many other things that the world does. We're not sexually immoral as the world is. We actively resist the sinful practices of the world. It's, it's holiness, but the word holy means to come apart, to be separate from. And we're often very good at the, the holiness part, how to be separate from. But God's people are also to be known, according to this verse, for what they do, for their generosity. Uh, they look after orphans and widows in distress. And it's, it's interesting to note that he says, look after orphans who obviously do not have parents. So there is no one to provide for them. They don't have an advocate. They don't have someone who is practically providing the basic necessities of life that a parent, a good parent always provides for their child. And a widow, likewise. Um, suddenly, she's obviously to be a widow. You have to have lost your husband. And this is a widow in distress. There are rich widows, I'm sure, then as now. But, but this was a widow who had absolutely nothing and no one to provide for her. So God's people are to be known for the generosity to particularly these kind of people. They can be generous to more, but how they treat these kind of people is a defining characteristic for a child of God. They provide physical assistance to those, to anyone who doesn't have anyone to help them. A widow, and the child is being described here, can't earn money. They can't feed and clothe themselves. They are often regarded as valueless to society at large. <laughs> They're certainly not what in our internet age we would call influencers. They were the opposite. So the people that everyone else would walk by and ignore and see no personal gain in helping them. The people of God do that. They are holy, but they are generous. They are compassionate to those who are in need. And when I think about it, it makes sense for why James would say, these are the two attributes that God is looking for, because they really come out of God's nature. I mean, we see regularly in the Bible, and also by the words of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, be holy because I am holy. If you're going to be a child of God, you've got, you got to share some attributes with him. You're going to be a chip off the block. You, you've got to resemble your father. And, and in, in one of the most obvious ways that we resemble our heavenly father is to be holy as he is holy. But also, there is also the, the, the whole aspect of generosity, of, of caring for those that no one else cares for. Jesus says in Matthew 5, love your enemies, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So these people may not be enemies, but my point is that God is saying, I give my blessing to all people. I care about all people. And if we are going to be a child of God, then we are not only interested in holiness, but we're also interested in undeserved generosity to those who are the most vulnerable and in need. The rest of the world may not, but they're not children of God. The children of God, we do, because that's what our family does. Nathan, Vicki, based on churches you've been familiar with through the years, which of these two characteristics receives the most emphasis? Holiness or generosity? Uh, I, I think most of the churches I've come across tend more towards holiness. Uh, there's certainly a compassion component, but if I had to choose one or the other, it is uh, it, it is that holiness, trying to keep itself unpolluted from the world. Uh, we're more known for what we're against than what we're for. Mm -hmm. Why do you think we lean in that direction? I think we're inwardly focused as human beings. And... You know, when we come to faith in Christ, we become oriented more towards God and others, but but we still struggle with that inward focusedness. And with that inward focusedness, ironically, we are uh, looking at our own sins. We're aware of our own sins, and so it's it's almost easier to try and uh, build up holiness uh, in your own self than try and reach out to compassion uh, for those who are in need. Yeah, I have seen through the years in my involvement with the church. That I've heard many, many, many more sermons on how we should live um, 
more God-pleasing lives, which is certainly not wrong. Um, but I have heard very few in how we need now to touch the lives of the people in our community who are in greatest need. Mm. I, I feel that in some ways we become like the Pharisees who Jesus addressed when they said, who is my neighbor? And he said, well, welcome to perhaps, and this is perhaps the best short story ever told and by literary experts. And that's the parable of the Good Samaritan. Hmm. And everyone else was so concerned about being holy, being on time for their religious activities, not being polluted, that they had no problem walking by the man who was beaten. But the Samaritan stopped and he was naked. So he had no idea what his culture was, what his background, whether he was on my side of the street, my religion or anything. But simply because he cared about people in need, he stopped and paid the price, literally, for the man to be healed and restored. That's the attribute of God that he's looking for. We love God with all our heart, soul, but we love our neighbor as ourselves. No surprise that we see these two attributes being put out by, by James. When he says, religion that our God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. It may not be our definition of what true religion is, but it's God's definition of what true religion is. And I don't know about you, but I find that, I find that convicting. Um, oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I got to tell you that I have spent almost all of my adult life in full-time pastoral ministry. And uh, I've enjoyed my time. It's been a wonderful time. But if I could go back and redo what I would do, I would say I would change the emphasis. I was way too much on uh, holiness and much too, uh, not near enough on meeting the practical needs of people around us. I, I was taught and I believed if I preach the gospel, that alone is going to change society. And I do believe in the gospel transforming power of God's word. Don't, don't get me wrong. But Jesus also believed that. Um, he came and said in Luke chapter 4 that I've come to preach the gospel, to preach the kingdom of God. I must go to the other towns and do that. But as he went, he healed and cared and showed genuine compassion to those who came to him in need. And I think um, too many times we've erred on one side rather than the other. And God is looking for both. And uh, if you want to find a passage that scares you, uh, one of mine that scares me <laughs> is uh, Matthew 25, parable of the sheep and the goats, where we read, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And the king will say to those on his right, come take your inheritance. Why? For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. And I was in prison and you came to visit me. And you know what he said to the people on the left? They didn't do that. This is not saying that good works get us into heaven. This is saying that if we are part of God's family, we will radiate the attributes of our heavenly father. We will strive for holiness because he is holy. And we will be generous with those who are in deepest need, just as God is generous to those who are in deepest need. How do we do that? How can we demonstrate the tangible love that we should be demonstrating to those who are most needy? How do we, how do we demonstrate that in our churches? Nathan, I want to pick on you for a minute. Because I, th I think as you and I have chatted through the years, I think your church, not a big church, you know, not in a famous place, but in your community, I think you've done a great job. And uh, can you just give some practical examples? Not everyone's going to be able to minister in the way that you have, but maybe this can stir some ideas for how we can have a generous, compassionate ministry to our community. Yeah, and thank you for that. We have a uh, small church, but it's big hearted. And I, I think if I can sum it up in one word, it would be partnerships. Uh, some of the ministries we've done have been our own that we've come up with, but more often than not, we partner with other organizations who are already doing things. So uh, years ago, we partnered and continue to partner with a, a local mechanic shop and offered free oil changes for single moms. And, uh, and that was a very fruitful ministry uh, and, and for about a decade. 
we uh, we've partnered with uh, with an organization, Freedom Builders, kind of like Habitat for Humanity, and we've gone and uh, fixed neighbors' houses uh, wow. and put on wheelchair ramps and put on yeah. roofs. And I lost track of how many roofs I was up there. In fact, they started putting me in charge of the projects. And I'm like, no, I'm just tell me what to do. I can't tell others what to do. <laughs> and, you know, at one point about, it's not the case anymore, but at one point about 10% of our, our entire congregation was made up of people who had at one point been in the foster care system uh, because our church had decided as individuals to uh, foster children and uh, and if possible to adopt them uh, that is a a wonderful very difficult commitment to make as a church and to encourage the church is uh, be a part of a uh, a fostering uh, program uh, we've uh, adopted classrooms in our local public schools and supplied them uh, with uh, you know paper pens uh, cleaning supplies it's hard to do now but we're still trying to do it and through those partnerships, we've had a really good relationship with our local school. So we've been able to offer uh, mentoring projects uh, with the school during school hours as a church uh, with some of the at-risk students and build relationships with uh, with the local school. That took decades uh, to, uh, to build up that relationship. But as we've just kind of uh, gone out there and helped them with whatever we could, they've, they've realized that we are trustworthy and we are going to help them out and be compassionate no matter what. And so I, I think partnering with people who are already doing something, and even yeah. if they're not a Christian organization, that's okay as long as they're not doing something antithetical to our Christian ethics. Uh, it's okay because, and sometimes preferable because you are bringing your Christian uh, love and your Christian witness. You're bringing Christ wherever you go, uh, soup kitchens, homeless shelters, those sorts of things. So, but what do you say about people who might object and say, you're encouraging people's addictions or their laziness. Uh, they need to learn to pull themselves up by their bro straps. What would you say to them? I can understand that. And the reality is you don't want to do anything that enables bad behavior. Okay. So yeah. don't give um, don't give someone uh, money if you suspect that they're going to use it for alcohol. Uh, but you can go out and get my, my brother-in-law had this great idea years ago is to carry around gift cards to places like McDonald's or Burger King or places that don't sell alcohol. And so then you, in the name of Christ, can give that gift card to someone who's hungry and they're going to go get a meal and you know they're not going to spend it on uh, alcohol. But look, at the end of the day, all of sin falls short of the glory of God. We've all made mistakes and the wonderful love and grace of Christ reaches out to us while we were yet sinners. And he loves us. He cares for us. We don't deserve salvation. Uh, we don't deserve uh, the second, third, fourth, fifth chances he gives us. And yet he does because he just radiates love, mercy, and grace. And so we can take on that same characteristic. Sure, we don't enable bad behavior. And if someone is uh, living in a trailer park because of bad decisions they made, but they need a wheelchair ramp in order to get grandma into the house, we're going to put on a wheelchair ramp. Sure. And we're going to love them and we're going to do it in the name of Jesus. That That's beautiful, Nathan. Amen. Vicki, any suggestions on how we can put this into practice as individuals? Yes, I think there are a lot of times we see people with needs. I don't know for sure if you should give money to homeless people. I have friends who work in homeless shelters and they say don't do it. But there are times I drive by a homeless person and I think I, I cannot I cannot do that without thinking about the verse, I was hungry, I was naked, and and, and you did this to me. Yeah. And it's talking yeah. about the Lord. And I think, you know what, if that person goes and spends this on alcohol, that's not my problem. That's their problem. My problem, my issue is I need to obey God. Amen. I once, well, I don't even want to tell you what I did, but um, to, help, to help people that are in need, to to encourage them. And, and I, I see it be and done and we all do we see it with the baptist uh, baptist whatever whatever it's called general men's convention they send people all over to feed people who are in need mm -hmm. the catholics used to put on and they may still marriage retreats and they were mm -hmm. excellent which is funny because they're led by priests who <laughs> 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 they weren't married um I live as you could, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are a lot of confessions. That's right. That's funny. 
I live in Dallas, and just in Dallas, there's a Presbyterian, a Methodist, and a Baptist hospital. And uh, there's Samaritan's Purse. You know, Billy Graham's son started that to give money Mm -hmm. to people hurting after explosions and bombs and tornadoes. And there are places we can get involved and people's lives we can touch. And when we see a need, that's the issue. When we see a need that we can meet, we should meet it. Right. Amen. This passage reminds me of the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19. You may remember him. He came to Jesus and asked, what good must I do to inherit eternal life? He's looking for the entrance requirements. Jesus says, uh, well, keep the commandments. That's holiness. And then he says, what do I lack? Jesus says, well, give your money to the poor. And then he walked away. He was willing to obey God's law, but he was not willing to show God's love to those who needed it the most. He failed to help those who were in desperate need. And that meant he walked away from Christ. You know, when you look at those tombstones of old, how would people summarize our life? When I think of that, I think of this verse. What does God require of his followers? A faith that values holiness. I hope I'm a person that values holiness. And a faith that helps the most desperate, is generous to those who are in most need. I hope that's true of my life. And at the end, it's true of yours. Because that's the kind of father we have. And the more we're like him, the more these will be seen in our life. What characteristics define your life? If you only could just get two words, do you think people would say holy and generous? Let's pray God makes these qualities evident in our lives today. I trust that today's discussion of God's Word has been helpful and served as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the Word, but doers. Together, let's bring God's Word to life, to our lives this week. The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global, equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more, or to support the work of this ministry, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. You can also support this show by sharing it on social media and telling your friends. Be sure to listen next Friday as we continue our discussion of the book of James and explore what God thinks about favoritism in the church. Be sure to join us.